Hi everyone, welcome. Welcome to the Urban Intersections webinar series. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today from different parts of the world uh, for our event on race, policy and the city. My name is Mara Nogueira and uh, I am an urban geography lecturer here at Buckback in the Department of Geography. And I'm also the program director for the Cities program together with my colleague Scott Rogers, which is in the Department of Film, Media and Cultural Studies, and Andrea Balatori, who is my colleague at the Geography Department. Uh, I create and, and convene this webinar series, Urban Intersections, which brings together people from different backgrounds to promote uh, transdisciplinary urban dialogues. The series is part of the Urban Intersections Experimental Collective, which gathers urban researchers at Buckback working in multiple departments across the social sciences and, and the humanities. If you're interested in finding out more about the series, you can visit our website uh, to watch our previous events and register in the mailing list to receive notifications about future talks. Today, our webinar is entitled Race, Policy and the City, and I welcome our two speakers, Dr. Megan McAlone and Dr. Jaime Amparo Alves. Megan's a lecturer in criminology in the Department of Criminology here at Buckback. And Jaime is an assistant professor in Black Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Both Megan and Jaime's research focus on racialized policing practices in diverse urban contexts. And each of them will be delivering a short talk on the topic today based on their research of about 20 minutes. Following that, we will give the speaker some room to react to each other's talk and to respond to questions from the audience. You are free to type your question in the chat at any time during the talk, but we are going to address those during the Q&A, that is after both Jaime and Megan have delivered their talks. So we are going to start with Megan, who, as I mentioned, is our colleague here at Buckbeck in the Criminology Department. I'm very pleased to, to welcome Megan today. Um, her primarily research is, um, focuses on, as I said, racialized policy, and her current research examines the racial and spatial patterning of the Metropolitan Police's use of powers contained in Section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994, which I'm sure we're going to hear a bit more about in her talk. Her talk today is entitled Saturation, Surveillance, Squads and Search Powers, Reflections on the Territorial Policing of Racialized Communities in London and Sydney. She will be discussing how the police in those two cities use territorial strategies um, and practice to regulate how members of racialized communities move throughout those cities and use public space. So without further ado, Megan, please, the, the screen is yours. Thank you very much again for, for being here with us today. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, just a second, sorry. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'm going to speak primarily about my PhD project, which looked at the targeted policing of so-called Middle Eastern communities in Sydney, Australia. And I had also intended in this first bit to speak about a project that I commenced at the beginning of this year, which looks at the London Metropolitan Police's use of powers contained in Section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 1994. Uh, but that research has been severely disrupted by the year that has been. Um, so depending on time, I may speak to that briefly uh, at the end, but I will at the least uh, intersperse my early thinking on that when we get to the discussion later. Um, so before I get too carried away in talking about the policing of Middle Eastern people in Sydney, I want to address why I've retained that highly problematic terminology, Middle Eastern, in my research. And so the term Middle Eastern has very rightly been subject to extensive critique. Not only are the geographic parameters of the Middle East imprecise and contested, but the term has also been criticised for being Eurocentric. In Australia, and, uh, in Australia, the term Middle Eastern is often used interchangeably with others, 
most notably Lebanese, and there's often a real slippage in the way that those two terms are used. So the classification of the Middle East used by the Australian Bureau of Statistics identifies six primary Middle Eastern source countries of birth, being Lebanon, Iraq, Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Israel. However, many Australians can trace their heritage elsewhere, so to Palestine or to Egypt, for example. And at the same time, many individuals who are classified or who self-identify as being Middle Eastern were actually born in Australia, but have at least one parent or one grandparent who was born in the Middle East. Uh, the census data are, as is typical, really tricky but would appear to indicate that there are well over 300,000 people with ancestry from the Middle East and North Africa region residing in the state of New South Wales. And something like two of every three of those people reside in the southwestern Sydney uh, region. In combination with the western suburbs, uh, where you do get smaller um, populations of Middle Eastern people, uh, in what you might call the Greater Western Sydney area. It encompasses something like 9,000 square kilometres. And as well as being a vast region, it's a notably diverse region. But it is one that overall is of relative socioeconomic disadvantage. But of course, what it means to be Middle Eastern and what it means to be Middle Eastern in Sydney is not simply a question of self-identified ancestry. The term or the signifier Middle Eastern is reductive in that it obliterates geographical, historical and cultural specificity. But it's also productive in that the use of the signifier Middle Eastern brings into being essentialist ideas about the behaviours and the pathologies of people who self-identify or who are otherwise identified as being Middle Eastern. The trope Middle Eastern functions as a deposit for Orientalist antipathies and contemporary fears about crime and terrorism. And so for Joseph Pugliese, through processes of collective attribution, race and its identificatory descriptors becomes coextensive with the activities of entire communities, rather than the few individuals who actually commit crimes. But while these processes of collective attribution, which are sustained by the media and by policing and by security practices, may well have gained traction following 9-11. It remains the case that the signifier Middle Eastern can be imbued with more specific meaning in different times and in different places owing to different racialising discourses and practices. And so what I'm hoping to be able to speak to today is that specific knowledges about Middle Eastern people have been born out of the coalescence of public discourses and police institutional policies and practices in New South Wales and in Sydney specifically. I don't mean to give a totalising or a monolithic sense of the state or of the police, but what I will say is that the police are a state institution and the police in New South Wales and elsewhere in Australia were instrumental in the colonisation of the unceded lands that we now call Australia. And through dispossession and through repression and regulation and the control of Indigenous peoples, um, we have to understand that those are foundational to the police and their mission in Australia. Now, of course, Indigenous peoples resisted the police and that resistance led to police organisations in Australia taking the forms that are familiar to us today, being highly centralised bureaucracies. Um, but I suppose that what I'm saying is that any discussion of racialised policing in Australia has to be set in the context of settler colonialism and ultimately of white supremacy. And that's not to say that we should simply draw parallels between the policing of Indigenous peoples and other groups, because doing that actually risks invisibilising the very specific nature of the history of policing Indigenous peoples in Australia. Um, and of course, the policing of Indigenous peoples is of fundamental importance to the settler colonial state because of contests over the land. Um, but I think that, that the targeted policing of racialised groups like Middle Eastern people serve the settler colonial state in different, um, but, ha but maybe like less material ways. And so it's well documented that Muslim and Arab communities have been intensely policed in many Western jurisdictions since 9-11. 
But Middle Eastern people in Sydney were aggressively policed throughout the 1990s and therefore before 9-11. And those policing policies and practices have been subject to very little scrutiny. My primary motivation for engaging in this research has been lived collective and intergenerational experiences of place, police power and racism. So to be more explicit, I am of Lebanese heritage. Until I moved to London in December of last year, I had always lived in southwestern Sydney. My research primarily draws on interviews with lawyers, community workers, members of the police's civilian multicultural advisory council, former police officers, and a range of official documents. For reasons that I can discuss later, if you'd like, uh, the police refused to participate in my research, as did many Middle Eastern people who remained pretty ambivalent about the project. Now, the targeted policing of Middle Eastern pe people in Sydney cannot be said to be part and parcel of the police responding to crime. Firstly, the police have conceded that they do not record the ethnicity of the people that they arrest. And so they can't actually demonstrate on the public record whether Middle Eastern people or anybody else, uh, you know, any other ethnic or racial group are disproportionately or overly involved in crime. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, as I will elaborate, Middle Eastern people are often policed in instances where they are unreasonably suspected of having committed an offence because police treat their race, associations, or their presence in southwestern Sydney as proxies for criminality. And so policing policies and practices bring race into being, defining Middle Eastern identity as a crime type. Since the mid to late 1990s, public discourses about Middle Eastern criminality in Sydney have increasingly centred on the notion that Middle Eastern people are markedly involved in serious, organised and violent crime, and an entire police industry has been created to police what has become publicly known as Middle Eastern organised crime. The received public narratives about the emergence of so-called Middle Eastern organised crime have been shaped primarily by journalists and former police officers, and they all tell a similar story, and that story goes something like this. Between 1994 and 1997, there was a Royal Commission into the New South Wales Police, which was called the Wood Royal Commission, and the Wood Royal Commission uncovered really sensational evidence of systemic corruption within the police, and it purged the service of some of its finest officers, never mind the fact that they had been engaged in corruption. And for that reason, many officers who remained in the service were apparently too afraid to carry on using time-honoured policing strategies and practices. And so in the words of one prominent commentator, the police were left impotent by the Royal Commission. And so the story goes, criminals and gangs of Middle Eastern background who were capable of greater violence than had been seen in New South Wales before, exploited the window of opportunity presented by the police's post-Royal Commission impotence to the extent that a new type of crime emerged and flourished across southwestern Sydney, being so-called Middle Eastern organised crime. And one of the foremost aims of my work has been to contest that received narrative by providing a counter-narrative tracing the socio-spatial practices that enabled the emergence and sustenance of the racialized neologism, Middle Eastern organized crime. And so the first point that I want to make about that is that the idea that the police were demoralized, impotent or docile after the Wood Royal Commission in the, in the late 1990s is almost entirely irreconcilable with the policing scholarship conducted in New South Wales at the time, which shows that institutionally, the police only became more potent after the Royal Commission. And what I mean by that is that the police took up an agenda of proactive performance measure driven crime fighting after the Royal Commission. And that agenda was very much in keeping with trends in other Anglo-American policing jurisdictions where a misinterpretation or a misreading of the police's role in the so-called New York miracle led many organisations to embrace proactive crime fighting. But in New South Wales specifically, this new agenda was, in my view, uh, an attempt by the police to reassert their authority after they had been very publicly embarrassed and undermined by the Wood Royal Commission. 
Within a short time of the Royal Commission, the New South Wales government had handed the police additional funding and powers and began applauding them for their role in cleaning up a prolific heroin market in the southwestern Sydney suburb of Cabramatta, never mind the assistance that the police had been given by a heroin drought. But anyway, uh, in my view, as political and public interest in Cabramatta began to decline, the police needed a new issue to justify keeping the funding and the powers that they'd obtained, and also a way of keeping their improving public reputation afloat. And so in 1998, the year after the Wood Royal Commission handed down its final report, the police's attention shifted to so-called Lebanese gangs in suburbs including Lakemba and Punchbowl, which, like Cabramatta, are in the southwestern Sydney region, just a little bit further south. As has been explored by Jock Collins and his colleagues in their influential work, Babs Kids, Cops and Crime, Police, political and public attention was drawn to Lebanese gangs following two events that took place in late 1998. Uh, the first of those events uh, was the tragic fatal stabbing of 14-year-old Edward Lee on Telopia Street in Punchbowl and the drive-by shooting of the nearby Lakemba police station a fortnight later was the second event. With a state election impending, a watershed was triggered in public discourses about the alleged criminal capacities of Lebanese communities, with politicians, senior police officers and reporters making unsubstantiated public accusations that Lebanese gangs were responsible for both crimes. The residents of Tilopia Street specifically were publicly admonished by police and politicians for erecting a wall of silence, Lee's manslaughter, and over the next few years the street was subject to repeated police crackdowns, generally involving heavily armed police, uh, usually in paramilitary formation, police helicopters and the like. And so Tilopia Street became a site of ongoing conflict and confrontation between residents and the police. Um, a front line, perhaps, where police needed, at times, to retreat and concede their authority. And so what began to develop then was a very clear institutionalised geopolitical imperative for the police to reclaim a sense of tactical superiority and control. But those power relations and the contests and the, con the confrontation sort of inherent in those power relations were staged not just on Tilopia Street, but across a great number of other places and areas in southwestern Sydney. So from the early 2000s, the police created a series of squads to swarm or saturate localities in Sydney's southwest, where large populations of Middle Eastern communities reside. And given the policing paradigms and practices that were in vogue at that time, the work of those squads often involved aggressive broken windows type street policing. Over time, aggressive proactive policing continued to be positioned and practiced as the solution to the alleged problem of Middle Eastern criminality. Meanwhile, the police minister faced mounting pressure from the New South Wales opposition leader who badgered him for, and I quote, being soft on Middle Eastern thugs and for not creating a centralised squad to consolidate the resources and the efforts of those squads occupying southwestern Sydney. And so eventually then the police minister confirmed that the police force would create a centralised Middle Eastern organised crime squad, explicitly named as such. The Middle Eastern Organised Crime Squad commenced, on the, uh, commenced its work on the 1st of May 2006 and carried on for over 11 years until December 2017. And the squad was essentially a force within a force. It was a multidisciplinary team comprising something like 150 police employees, including detectives, intelligence analysts, uniformed general duties officers, and the squad even had its very own dedicated highway patrol unit. I think it's also worth noting that the period that the Middle Eastern Organised Crime Squad was in operation coincided with the institution of like highly professionalised manipulation of the media by the police force for public relations and for operational and for political ends. And so in a best-selling book about the Middle Eastern Organised Crime Squad, written by a crime reporter attached to a conservative newspaper at the suggestion of serving police officers, 
It has been claimed that to understand Middle Eastern organised crime, one must first appreciate that, and I quote, the concept of Middle Eastern organised crime had been germinating across the suburbs of southwestern Sydney for years, eventually manifesting in a tentative criminal strata, a world of dog-eat-dog where drug dealing and car rebirthing had become their own industries and were treated like trade skills that could be handed down within families, father to son, brother to brother and cousin to cousin. The writer adds that in this context, Middle Eastern organised crime encompassed diverse crimes, including rape, serious assault, murder, arson, extortion, prostitution, money laundering, immigration offences, insurance fraud, identity fraud, terrorism, car rebirthing and weapons offences. Now, this is obviously a sensationalised account, but it does contain some truth. And what I mean by that is that there are Middle Eastern men who engage in serious, organised and violent crime in southwestern Sydney. Some of them uh, openly and quite performatively embrace their characterisation as Middle Eastern organised criminals. But their doing so, so should be understood as a form of political action. And in many ways, they have appropriated the racialised neologism, Middle Eastern organised crime, and given it new meaning. I am nevertheless concerned with the way in which accounts like the one that I've just read racialize and deterministically inscribe Middle Eastern familial relations with serious criminality. But they also position Middle Eastern men as the ultimate test of whether the police force and its hypermasculine paramilitary Middle Eastern organized crime squad have overcome their post Royal Commission impotence. What I would add too is that while image management is an important site of police practice carried out primarily by media savvy PR people attached to police media units, the practices of operational police may look very different to the mediated images of police work that you see in the papers and on the TV. And so for that reason, it's really important to look at the ways in which the institutional practices of sworn police officers racialise crime too. In practice, then, the police force increasingly adopted not only proactive but also intelligence-led policing strategies throughout the 2000s. Uh, and the way that I understand it, above all else, intelligence-led policing is animated by a desire to anticipate and act on risky uh, people, risky behaviours, risky locations, and all of that rests upon police intelligence. And for that reason, most of the Middle Eastern Organised Crime Squad's work came to be premised on trawling southwestern Sydney for information using low level street and traffic powers. Doing so enabled the police to conduct surveillance and to collect information on the movements of people in vehicles, to impede people's mobility through space, and to communicate police authority. And so Maybe it's unsurprising then that most of the arrests and charges arising out of the squad's work were totally unrelated to serious organised or violent crime, as journalistic and police rhetoric about the squad might have had us believe. Uh, and I know that because in 2018 I submitted a freedom of information request asking the police to enumerate the arrests, charges and prosecutions arising from the squad's work. And overall, traffic-related charges made up over one third of the entirety of the squad's work in the 11 years that it was in operation. Um, so I might just wrap up then, and what I'll say to wrap up is that the term Middle Eastern organised crime is a catch-all label for a range of criminal and antisocial behaviours allegedly carried out by Middle Eastern people. But Middle Eastern organised crime doesn't signify a type of crime in the typical sense. Instead, the racialised policing of Middle Eastern people in Sydney throughout the last two or three decades has defined Middle Eastern identity as a crime type. And so the byword Middle Eastern organised crime is essentially a metonym. It has autonomic functions and it brings to mind not only a range of serious criminal offences, but it also brings to mind southwestern Sydney. The images that come to mind are a little bit difficult to reconcile with the fact that a significant proportion of the policing of Middle Eastern organised crime amounted to the policing of traffic related offences, but the involvement of a specialist Middle Eastern organised crime squad effectively racialised those offences as serious crime. 
And the last thing that I'll say is that through the deployment and the work of the Middle Eastern Organised Crime Squad and its predecessors, South West Sydney has been racialised as a tract of serious organised and violent crime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, can you guys hear me now? I, I, I was told that my internet was cutting severely before. <laughs> is this better now? It is better now, right? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, that w when you need your internet, it, it doesn't work. So um, uh, thanks a lot, Megan. And and now I'm 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 just gonna uh, keep my video off and, and hoping that it's gonna work a bit better this way. Uh, and now I'm gonna pass on the screen to Jaime who, as I mentioned before, is an assistant professor in the Department of Black Studies at the University of California. Um, uh, Jaime is the author of the monograph The Anti-Black City, Policy, Terror and Black Urban Life in Brazil, which has been published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2018. Uh, his current research focuses on racialized geographies of policing Black on governability and urban security politics in Colombia and Brazil. And his talk today entitled Blue Light, Black Death, Divine Violence and Black Sovereignty in the Afropolis will draw from this current research um, to critically discuss the myth of police, police victimization and explore responses of black youth engaged, engaged in outlawed forms of resistance. Thanks again, Jaime, Jaime, for joining us today. And uh, the, the screen is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mara, for the invitation. Thank you, Megan, for your very insightful presentation. Thank you, Raymond, for helping us deal with the logistics. I'm very lost with these things. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. I will read a, a very short piece, part of my, my ongoing work. I'm going to read some part of this ethnographic uh, moment with some gang members in the shanty towns of Cali in Colombia. It's from there that I wanted to try to connect with Megan's discussion about police territoriality and how uh, black people respond to police brutality, to police terror in these specialities of anti-blackness. So an ethnographic moment. Two officers entered the barrio, pursuing a man. Everyone ran the streets to see what was happening when the officers began to fire randomly and people evaded to shelters. The officers fell from the motorcycle and continued to shoot in the direction of the escape. When residents realized that Maria, a 14-year-old girl who was coming from school, was shot by a stray bullet, they ran into the two officers blocking the way. No, look, you hit the Peladita, the little girl. Now take her to the hospital, they insisted. The officers complained it was not their fault and that there was no way to know where the bullet came from. We were raised, enraged, a, member, a gang member tell me. Big bam, big, big punch, kicks. We destroyed the motorcycle and you put the motherfuckers to run away. I had the opportunity to witness and to hear about several similar accounts of open confrontations between local residents and police officers in El Guayacan, a predominantly black neighborhood located in the east side of Cali, Colombia. Accounts of retaliations against the police abound. An officer badly hit in the head by a rock while patrolling the street, a woman that you throw throwing a pot of urine on an officer while her son was aggressively frisked in front of the home, a child that hit the officer with a stick to help rescue his mother from being arrested, and the list goes on. The residents tell the stories as revenge against the police brutality, whereas the police use them to justify the use of force against the so-called ungovernable residents of El Guayacan. He is an officer telling me the story of a colleague that who was hospitalized after being assaulted while patrolling the streets. He says, he went to attend a call and someone threw a rock that broke his head. 
these people must be brought to justice. These people are obstructing the law. To raise a hand against the police is a crime. These people are undis undisciplined. They see the police as the enemy." End quote. I was not sympathetic with the commander's account, quite the opposite. I almost laughed about that. Although it is true that officers encounter violence when performing the, the labor, we know that it is a fantasy. The over-dramatization of the victimization hides the fact that the violence they suffer is part and parcel of the work they perform and is not different from other professions. Although at times real, the police victimization narrative can be read as what legal scholar Frank Cooper calls the myth of cop fragility. That's what I want to go. He contends that such mythology draws a false equivalence between blue lives and black lives by hijacking the meanings of a black struggle and thus repositioning police officers and whites in general as the new victims of racism. In that sense, the author highlights, quote, white backlash better explains blue lives matters self-defense perspective than does the vulnerability of police officers to attack, end quote. So by shifting the meanings of the black struggle for life, the police also cannibalize the terms of the debate. While in Cali, in Cali the police certainly uh, 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 suffer uh, uh, attacks, as I, I, I just so, uh, showed, and the mythology about police victimization is indeed a powerful one that scholars should be cautious to not to uncritically reproduce. So in this talk, I wanted to you know to call our attention to this raising in this number of new ethnographies, new works on policy that tries to so-called what they say to humanize the police. What does this project of humanizing the police mean? in face of the you know, uh, 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 increasing in, in this number of police fatal fatalities by the police, or in, in face of these calls from the street to burn it down, to abolish the police. So what does it mean for us as scholars try to humanize the police? Or even better, what should be our take in, in this conversation about police violence, to not reify in these various categories? Jaime, Jaime, sorry. Before you go, yes. Are you because you haven't shared your slides, and I wonder if you you would like to put them. Yes, I should. I should have shared by now. I'm sorry. I will thank you. I'll do it. So, so can anybody see the first slide? Okay, I see now how it's working. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So now, we, um, at which slide are you in? Would you like me to? Oh, I'm in the first, right? Yes, that's the first one. Yeah. Yes, yes. Now you can go to the second one. Thank you. OK, you're welcome. I think you can just pass as you see like the theme because it's going to be hard to I'm, I'm reading here. I know the page, I know, I know the screen as we, I talk. <laughs> It's okay. I'll, I'll do my best if I don't change it. Yes. Yes. The <laughs> slide is just illustrative. Technical. So in this talk, I want to, yes. I want to focus not in the police victimization account, but rather on the spatial, spatial politics of resistance to police terror by black youth, considered the source of insecurity in the city. If the moral geographies of police produces black residents as evil in the neighborhoods as ungovernable topographies, some black youth mobilize the stigmatized territorial identity to decolonize the city. Let's consider some unapologetic, outlawed, insurgent forms of politics embraced by the undeserved, racialized criminal. Uh, and what kind of work black black race perform in these colonial spaces? Uh, so an ethnographic moment again. We grabbed a beer and sat in the side of the road. Pablo, the gang member, kept alert, looking for each sign of danger. He had a gun hidden in his waist. He says to protect the barrio against the rival gangs and the officers. This protection had cost him a lug and several assassination attempts that are registered in his marked body. He laughed while pointing to the scars. This way my chest almost hit my heart. 
This one destroyed my leg, my left leg, leg and this one broke my leg. The marks that Pib, as he's called, carried on his body are indexes of a larger process of spatial violence that have, that have victimized, victimized other residents. Such regimes of spatial dominance is, pronoun is pronounced, for example, in the infrastructural violence of a city that is unable to provide basic services to the internally displaced black population, IDP, running away from the armed conflict in the Pacific zone of, the Col of Colombia. It is also visible in the humiliation residents like his mother, Iris, endure in daily battle to cross the city to serve a white mestizo family as a domestic servant, or yet in the moral geography of policing, represented by community police, NGO, philanthropy, churches, all these crusades try to save the, the souls of black people in this place. Pablo stood his ground and tried to resist being killed by the police and by death squads called limpieza social, social cleansing, but he was always in the edge, on the edge. Before he became a gang member, he, his dream was to become a soccer player, but this dream faded away when he broke his left leg during an improvised soccer game in the middle of the street. He underwent a surgery that would never correct the broken bone, and Pablo gave up from doing what he liked the most. It also meant he could not help support his mother, Iris, and his little daughter, Anita. While Iris consumed her life working non-stop for a white mestizo family, Pablo dreamed that he would one day make a big, big business, big void, a real hustle that would change his family's fate. Pablo didn't leave to rescue his mother from poverty. He left home around 2 in the afternoon on a sunny day in August 2018 to never come back. Iris had cautioned him not to cross the frontier invisible, the streets that divide, the lines that divide gang territories in Cali. As a member of La Quinta, again the local gang, Pablo was always in danger of being arrested by the police or killed by rival gang members. Failed with resentment that she could not convince him to stay home that day, Iris promised me that she would avenge him, Pibi. The details of his death is un are unclear, but according to rumors, he was shot three times by a man riding a motorcycle while waiting for a pirate tax to return home. Pablo agonized in the streets until someone brought him to the east side overcrowded in the ill-equipped equipped hospital when he was pronounced dead. Pablo's death is one of 5,049 murders documented in the city within the last four years. In the black geographies of the east side of Cali, the police maintained the city's colonial order by enforcing ontological spatial boundaries that hold black youth and local residents, especially captive in the urban margins. Pablo told me, la policia la odio, I hate the police. The police, he is a son of a bitch, a sapa with a pucha. They are very brutal. They come to search you, treat you like shitty, hitting you, talking shit about you. Pablo had been arrested on several occasions, and by the time of our meeting, he was again under a housing, a housing a arrest for being caught with a gun. This, ar this arrest, however, didn't prevent him from keeping his promise to defend the barrio against the rival gangs or against the police. In his word, he was a malo. He was an evil person. Pablo offered an explanation why society considered him a evil person. Because one refused to be killed. That's it. They want us to, to be willing to be killed. To just let, the, let them come and kill one's family. Fuck it. In the barrio where Pablo knew, where people knew Pablo and shared the same spatial ex exclusion from the city, some residents, uh, mainly small business owners, view individuals like him as a problem for attracting conflict to the barrio. But others racial, rationalize the praxis as part of a larger process of racial interpolation and racial criminalization. As the sister of a young man killed in one of these countless confrontations explained, most of the time, one is not evil, one is made evil. The youth become evil not because they want to. Sometimes it is just to experiment, or the times it is for their life condition, or the times it is just because something happened with a relative. 
Pablo, in this case, became evil when his brother was killed. But regardless of the rationality of his activities, evilness should be understood here as an intertwining process of subjective formation that comprises racial interpolation as criminal and self-making, self-claimed rage as a strategy to disrupt the colonial order of the city. So I invite you to read Pablo's rage as an assertion of his autonomy in humanity. Black rage is one important political resource that in this context may take a spe special forms such as setting states on fire, gang territoriality, urban riots, bus ferry evasion, even retaliatory violence against the police. Rarely are this repertoire of deviant practices regarded as insurgent spatial politics. They are at best seen as instrumental or self-serving acts of resistance against e economic exclusion. Still, in the question of the question of black resistance outside the law should be seen not only as a struggle for social inclusion, but also, and perhaps more fundamentally, a question for radical repositioning of black lives within the city politics. This repositioning is only possible through a violence that challenges and overcomes the condition, even if in a little form. If policing is the enforcement of this colonial order, how should the rest of the city respond to the enforce? Black subjects have not refused to address this challenge. And that's my... Hey? Black struggles have not refused to address this challenge, and this is what I wanted to emphasize in this conversation. For instance, one day I was in the community center when a friend arrived upset that the officers had closed the street and randomly picked up a youth to be taken to the police station for further verification of the status, criminal status. As the officers loaded the police truck with black bodies, residents formed a human belt around the car to free the kids. The officers attempted to proceed with the arrests, but as more and more residents closed the cycle and the tensions escalated, they had no choice but to unlock the doors. Pablo also once recounted the confrontation at the funeral of another gang member. I don't know why the police hated him. He was a decent man, but the police were always trying to fuck with his life, he says. Pablo and La Quinta were armed at the funeral when the officers arrived and fatally shot Pedro, the cousin of the individual whose funeral they were attending. That is when we became even more enraged half a, an hour shooting at the smart party, those motherfuckers. According to Seb, as another gang member, the reason why they usually made the tombs to run away, made the police to run away, was because the officers didn't respect any legal boundaries when dealing with local residents. Everyone was vulnerable to police brutality, regardless of their behavior. This generalized criminalization also created solidarity in moments of confrontations when the members of the community joined the gang and challenged the police. For example, in the case of the girl that was killed when she's coming from school that I opened this conversation. So to conclude, because I really wanted us to have this discussion with Mega. They call us evil because we refuse to be killed. This is Pablo again. Pablo not only refused to comply to the regime of law, but he also claimed that making war was the only possible way to change his condition. He was an enraged person, one that in Fanon's colonial subject formation was dominated, but not domesticated. I see black rage as a statement on the limits of the grammar of citizenship rights, including the Marxist-oriented right to the city politics, that quite often do not pay attention to the structural antagonism between white citizens and black non-beings that organize cities' life. If in the white imagination of the colonizer, the native is declared the impervious of ethics, represents not only the absence of values, but also the negation of values, in Fanon's words, then it is outside of the white morality that one must fight for liberation. Indeed, if one considers black rage as a refusal to be victim, a refusal to be spatially disciplined by the technology of policing, and a refusal to comply with white morality, then 
this should be where the evil appears as the radical agent of the colonization making no concession to the regime of legality that wants them to be killed, the black evil embraces pure violence as the force that may challenge the colonial order of the city. Here's also where I'm trying to, I'm, trying, I'm not sure if it is convincing you, but I'm trying to dialogue here between, with Benjamin, Walter Benjamin and Fanon. This is where Benjamin meets Fanon. Benjamin, advocated the politics of a pure means as the radical embracing of a transcendental violence that challenges the law-making, law-preserving violence represented by the work of policy. Fanon saw total liberation as the result of, quote, a murderous and decisive confrontation, and, end quote, to turn the world upside down and to create a new humanity in which black life is worth living. Against the mythical legal violence that found the law, there is divine violence. A divine violence that rejects it altogether, for it is free from white ethics and white morality. In that sense, beyond the pathological narratives of black crime, Pablo's rage suggests a decision to claim sovereignty of his life. If his life experience can be generalized to understand the black urban condition, so can Fanon's still valid call. Decolonization is a program of complete disorder. The great certain doubt cannot be postponed. Thank you. Hi, Jaime. Thank you so much. I, I, I must apologize. I don't think I've, great, I, I've done a great job with this, <laughs> with this slide. <laughs> you did. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, I would like now uh, to invite people to ask questions in, in the chat room, but also welcome uh, uh, Megan back so we can have a little conversation um, to kick us off uh, while people are still thinking about questions. Um, so, I, I mean, I, first I'd like to see if, if either Jaime or Megan, if you would like to uh, pose questions to each other. I have a couple, if you, if you <laughs> I think, I think that your talks actually are quite complementary in the sense that the way I've seen it, uh, you approach the, 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 the same kind of problem while in different contexts, but from a kind of like police perspective and a more kind of genealogy of, of, of the police action and how the power that the police exert on those racialized communities is kind of created through this um, uh, kind of regimes that create the squads. And, and I think it speaks very well as well to uh, Jaime's context, although we are talking about Colombia, uh, we know that Colombia's history is also a history of uh, uh, criminal, sort of like dealing with drug trafficking. Uh, it's part of the history of, of the country in a way, and that has also probably generated the kinds of, of uh, special powers for the police that that that, that uh, Megan was talking about in the context of um, of um, uh, Australia. Um, so I, I wonder if like you guys see a bit that kind of interface and also if Megan sees the same kind of resistance movements that uh, Jaime was talking about uh, in the Colombian case in the case of, of Australia as well, if that makes sense. Any of you would like to respond to that, Jaime? Yeah, yeah, I, I missed a little bit of your, 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 oh, your... Sorry, oh, my internet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking about how, uh, in the case of Australia, as Megan was saying, there is this kind of like um, um, sort of regulations and, and special mm -hmm. sessions for the police that are created because of this kind of history of organized crime in, in Australia. Whereas uh, in the case of Colombia, you have a similar situation for the kind of drug trafficking and the way that this is kind of very much embedded in, in Colombia's uh, history. And I was wondering if you, if you see similar things in the way that the police acts and how 
it's kind of shaped by those uh, histories of, of um, uh, you know, apart from the colonial history, as you've pointed out. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I think there are some similarities here. I see some resonance from Megan's work. Uh, in, uh, in in the in the context of Colombia, I see some similarity. Yet in the case of Colombia, there is something very interesting, not surprising though, to see that as most of us know, Colombia in Cali in particular, no, is is internationally known, no, even even in stigmatized way as a city of the drug dealer, the cartel, right, the Cali cartel. Mm -hmm. But you get surprised that in Cali, the cartel, at least in everyday conversations, doesn't seem to be the problem of violence. Police, eh, 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 the, the, the way that policing is configured in Cali is not against the, the cartel. And in the popular imaginary, it's not the cartel that was the main threat of security in Cali. Although, of course, there is an overgeneralization, over-exaggeration, dramatization of the cartel as well. But the main source of the problem is not the cartel, is the black population in Cali. Although the cartel in the 80s, in the late, late, uh, late early, early 80s, in late 90s, the cartel was very intense, intense in Cali, you know? and the main cause of most of this problem there, this, this battles around the control of this territorial, this corridors for, the, for, for, for drugs in the Cali, in, in Cali region, People, residents say, well, it was it was when the black population was migrating from the Pacific. When they came from Cali is when the city became a violent place. So this anti-blackness informs even the conceptualization of the space and the time in Cali, in a way that people can play with the time, like forgetting, selectively forgetting, for example, the cartels, forgetting all the problems, right, in the, the, the very, the very complicated intertwined process of the armed conflict that also, you know, split through the urban, to the split over the urban, uh, urban areas, they forget this selectively and they remember precisely the moment when the Pacific coast becomes a problem for the black population, the, 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 the paramilitaries go to the Pacific, like, fight with the guerrillas and the black population starts to come into Cali. So it's when the black population arrives to Cali that the city becomes this complicated, troubled place to live. No, oh, thanks. Thanks, Diane. Uh, Megan, I, 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 you had a, a little issue there with your internet. I don't know if you, if you <laughs> uh, got my question. I was just like trying to sort of relate the, your, your presentation to Jaime's and asking in your case, I guess, about more the resistance part of the, of the story. If apart from just like claiming, as you said, the, this kind of identity, uh, people also resist police action, perhaps in also in racialized ways. Yeah, sorry about that. That was a bit rude of me to drop out. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it wasn't intentional. Um, just before I answer the question, uh, I just want to say, Jamie, I, that was incredible and that, um, I really found the detail that you shared like, haunting and chilling in many ways um, and I'm sure that it's not easy to do the research that you do but um, it's incredible and uh, I think, you know, it's uh, as policing scholars we often um, don't focus enough on resistance which is counterintuitive because I think realistically if you're going to have a genuine understanding of race you need to understand resistance as well um, and so yeah thank you for sharing that and for not sanitizing it um, but uh, in terms of resistance uh, I think what I would say is that it's kind of understated and it occurs in mundane but sometimes really uh, really clever and very cheeky ways. I think there's something to be said for, so what, you know, in terms of the uh, resistance to policing of Middle Eastern communities in Sydney, there's no movement per se. I wonder maybe if that comes from the fact that, um, I mean, community is a slippery term anyway, but Middle Eastern also is so highly problematic, you know, as a Lebanese Christian, I don't know what I have in common with other Middle Eastern people. And so I think potentially that might make, you know, 
um, mobilization and, and movement building difficult except for the fact that um, you know we as Middle Eastern people are clearly um, the subject of you know state targeting and state violence so maybe it's surprising there isn't a movement but um, what I would say is that yeah the resistance kind of happens in more mundane ways and one of my favorite uh, stories actually is that um, it, 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 it's quite common for young Middle Eastern men actually now to have the initials MEOC, Middle Eastern Organised Criminal, tattooed on themselves. Um, and sometimes I've seen I've seen a guy actually who's got um, on both legs highway patrol cars with the tag MEOC, you know, tattooed on. And he was very upset to hear that the police replaced their cars every six weeks. So his tattoos became outdated very quickly. Um, but one of the other things that um, young Middle Eastern men have done is they went out and coordinated, uh, got coordinated uh, registration plates for their cars because one of the key ways that the police um, police Middle Eastern men is to update databases, uh, you know, uh, that are initially, you know, tied to their registration so that they can follow them around and sort of have access to all this information. Um, and so they went out and got MEOC uh, number plates and the police were very displeased and actually forced the registration um, power registration part of the state government to have the plates reclaimed. Um, but actually what that was doing is, is turning police surveillance back on itself. They knew they were being watched and they were signalling that to the police. Um, yeah, that's sort of an answer, I hope. Yeah, that's thanks, thanks so much for, for sharing. Uh, so Scott has a question for um, uh, Jaime. So, um, so Jaime, about the dangers and risks or risks that might go along with ethnographic research in the settings that you research, uh, researching police and also settings such as prisons must carry risks for you as well as for your respondents and participants. How do you negotiate? Thank you. Yeah, the danger is always there, right? Um, you know, um, that's a very important question because there is this tradition in anthropology, ethnographies of policing, these heroes, sometimes the macho heroes that go to this place and as much data for this dangerous place we bring more, we have validation, academic validation, all this, right? I really do not invest in that, although I do not criticize the colleagues that have the courage to explore this possibility to put themselves in danger to get these data. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these data comes more from my grounded involvement with the community. I, uh, coming from a perspective of activist anthropology that when these data comes from, they're not coming from just because I was there collecting data, it's coming from our own involvement, organic involvement with the community. So I guess this is part of the experience, you know, uh, that experience or embodied experience of leaving the place and leaving the city, you know, in the very skin. And that by that I mean, pass through this process of vulnerability, privilege as somebody trained in academic that can leave the place wherever I want to, but at the same time somebody that has organic ties that is also from places yeah, that's like that. yeah that's uh, I, I was wondering actually like that, that question could in a way also be applied for you Megan uh, and you mentioned in your presentation that you kind of like had difficulties in kind of like assessing both the police and some of the Middle Eastern men and and uh, I was wondering as well for both of you there is quite a gendered uh, aspect as well as a racialized aspect of, of the people you're dealing with uh, and I mean, it, it, it's implicitly always about men, right? So perhaps like uh, there is a, both a gender aspect on your participants, but also in, in the research itself, right? Do you want to comment a bit, Megan, on that? Yeah, cool. Um, that's a brilliant question. I think, um, yes, absolutely. As uh, you know, a visibly young woman doing this research, I do wonder what it would have been like had I um, you know, 
a different person. That's a silly thing to say. I also wonder what it would have been like if um, I uh, had, if my paternal grandfather hadn't had a white name, um, if that might have increased participation in some way or another. Because what often happened was when I finally convinced uh, somebody who had been policed to sort of sit down and have a chat with me. It was often a recognition as soon as I sat down of kind of like, oh, I've read you now and you're um, not just a, somebody meddling from a university, like you might have a stake in this. Um, and conversely, um, I think the police have really serious gatekeeping going on, um, the New South Wales police specifically, um, they don't allow a lot of external research to be carried out in collaboration with police officers, certainly not any research that they think might potentially raise some sort of PR issue. Um, and I think as well it's important to say that this, this research gatekeeping happens in tandem with the PR media management and image management stuff that I was talking about earlier. So at the same time that I was denied access to interviews with officers from the Middle East and Organised Crime Squad within weeks, that, that book that I spoke about um, that was written at the, you know, at the insistence of the police came out, you know. So um, is it clear double standard there for conservative, um, you know, reporters and for university researchers. Um, one thing I would say is that um, I've been thinking through actually sort of the gendered aspects of, um, you know, who participated in my research and so on. And I, I do wonder what that is um, because it's not as though my, my presentation might have given a, a different uh, impression, but it's not as though Middle Eastern women aren't over policed and it doesn't just happen as them you know, having a social position as being someone's wife or someone's uh, sister, or like it, that does happen a lot of the time. Uh, women are targeted for surveillance where their husband or their, their partner is, is himself under police surveillance. But women are policed for who they are too, not just for their association. And so I do wonder um, what that is. And I think that, you know, when I look to turn this into a monograph, I really do need to sit down and think about how I might. Uh, give better voice to Middle Eastern women. Oh, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. It's a kind of like a make us think about how, not you know, uh, our bodies as, re as researchers is also kind mm -hmm. of like gendered and, and racialized, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have another question for you, Megan, from uh, Stanlip, uh I think. Uh, my Megan comment on the increasing role of platform policing cultural capitalism working in tandem in driving the enhanced spatial control imaginary of punitive urbanism. If I understood that question, I may <laughs> so please feel free to let me know if I haven't. Um, the first thing I would say is that the New South Wales Police are incredibly well funded and they are very much tapped into these cloud geographies and the particular technologies that allow them to sort of share and, and create these repositories of information. The first um, policy or practice that comes to mind that might provide an, an example, I suppose, is um, the police will uh, sometimes issue this type of order, it's called a firearms prohibition order. Uh, it's not strangely to receive a firearms prohibition order you don't need to be linked with firearms in any way um, and so what the police do actually is issue firearms prohibition orders because what they do is when you have an order issue it enlivens a particular set of search powers that don't require police suspicion but what they do also the police is they use ANPR technology automatic number plate recognition and they have it mounted in their cars I see it around London the streets um, but in New South Wales they have it mounted in cars and they'll just sweep southwestern Sydney um, they can do like they can sweep six number plates a second um, and yeah they create these repositories of information drive about um, scan for registration plates and you know it, it enlivens territorial policing kind of in two ways if you're in southwestern Sydney, you're in a high crime area, so I'm going to stop you and search you. And if you're outside of southwestern Sydney, if you've violated space by leaving your space, we're going to stop you too because you're incongruous with the area and you shouldn't be here, basically. Um, and so it, it controls people's movement um, through space and through place, absolutely. I don't know if I've answered that question, um, but 
I mean, I, I think I think so. Maybe there was a, an aspect of it which was more about how perhaps the participation of like private business in, in prisons itself might be related. But I guess like this kind of like technologies of surveillance that you're talking about play a big role. Um, and and I, I was wondering um, if it plays a role in your case as well, Jaime. I know, um, and perhaps not as much, in, I don't know about the case of Colombia, but I'm thinking about uh, your previous research in Brazil as well, where this kind of like technologies of, of policing with the UPPs in Rio and other attempts at, at kind of like controlling forms of organized crime in Brazil can also be kind of categorized as these types of uh, uh, technologies of policing. And how that might play a role in either of the contexts you 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 you've been doing research um, uh, throughout your life. Yes, yeah, thank you. I and I I think this is a potential for for dialogue with Megan's very exciting research agenda because not only the the, the security, not the geopolitics of security, but we are talking here. I think imperial geographies of policing, you no. Know? So you think about the involvement of the United States pre and post the 9-11, but also how the United States is totally implicated in most of this policing of blacks and brown bodies, racialization of the Middle Eastern, racializations of Afro-Brazilians, Afro-Colombians. So I think we can see that very clearly in the case of Brazil, as Mara is saying, the, the UPPs, the case, how Brazilian presidents, even the leftist president, signed the defense cooperation agreement with the U.S. president Barack Obama. Very telling that Obama was one that one that mostly invested in, in, in the securitization of the continent, with Brazilian government to police the South Atlantic coast, the African African coast. And in the case of Colombia, very, very, very important this question because we cannot talk about the fate of people like PIB, like Yuris, like millions of Colombians, Afro-Colombians displaced from the Pacific coast, a area with you know very rich area in mine minerals. Uh, uh, we cannot separate this from this from the peace deal. No, backed by the U.S. government, for example, the aerial spray of pesticide by the uh, funded by the U.S. government in the war on, on, on drugs in Colombia, and how all these creating eviscerating politics for black people. Black people are displaced, they are running away once again, you no, know, from 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 these areas to places like Cali, where they're gonna be killed, where they live in these geographies over police the geography. So we can tie no tie the dots between the Middle East, the uh, South America, Africa, all this, how it is connected these imperial geographies of policing that former President Barack Obama pushed forth in a very visceral, chronic, tragic way. Yeah, I guess I guess it's interesting to think about at least like uh, when when Megan was speaking like this kind of controlling of of movement, whereas in the, in 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 the Colombian case it seems like the movement is uh, pushed by uh, techniques of of, of police, like people like this is sort of internal displacement in the case of Colombia is 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 a very sort of like generous uh, case as as far as I as, as I understand. Um, we have another question for Megan from Winnie. Um, you mentioned 30% of offenses detected by the squad were traffic offenses. And do you know the proportion for low level drug offenses, for, for instance, possession, and how uh, the policing of low level drug offenses were considered as a metric of success or a target of the policy of Middle Eastern communities? That's okay. Hey, Winnie, by the way, how are you? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I'm going to come back to cars again. I hate to do that, but I really do think that in the Australian context, and I think potentially in the United States as well, cars are a real repository of police power um, where they should provide people with opportunities to move about. Actually, they make a lot of people vulnerable to police in intervention. And so I do have that data 
although not handy, unfortunately, and it would take me several hours to sort through my thousand emails, but I can share that with you after, Winnie. But one of the problems I would say is that the police record keeping, despite the fact that I expended a great deal of energy to try and get that data, is pretty shoddy. So basically it came back to me like five categories. And traffic offence was always the most pronounced, so that um, in each calendar year that the squad was in operation. Um, and it just said drug offence, you know, so I don't know if that's possession, I don't know if that's uh, something potentially a bit more serious. But what I would say is that um, absolutely there's a police methodology and a method of, um, I guess, targeting the low-hanging fruit. So I know that this person is possessing drugs and they may have information which we can organisationally encode as intelligence about a dealer about who, a trafficker or whatever and so yeah there is a real methodology of intervening against people for minor offences like possession with the ultimate view then of trying to get more information out of them but also one of the things that police will do is use uh, random breath testing powers rbt powers um, all you need to be doing is driving a car and you're, you're liable to be stopped for an rbt and then when they pull you over um, using those powers, they can't yet search, but what they'll do is invent a smell. So I can smell cannabis and all of a sudden I have grounds to search and it's incredibly difficult to challenge a smell in court if it goes that far. Um, so I don't know, yeah, drug, uh, drug offences, um, the higher end of you know, charging scales would certainly be considered a metric of uh, success for policing the least and organised crime, but also low-level offences are very much part of the methodology and the method of policing the least and people. I hope that's answered the question. Yeah, when, when you were talking, I was just wondering, like thinking to myself that it seems like you have a very sort of expensive trafficking police in, 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 in Sydney, right? Because 30% of the squad, which I'm like, I expect to be much more expensive than a regular kind of uh, or a trafficking police just to kind of like wow. thirty percent of the offenses being just related to trafficking. It's like it's it's a it's a bit of a joke. Uh, yeah, um, it's racialized a serious crime. You know, you don't hear about those parts of the squad's work in in public discourse. You hear about the big busts or the you know, we've apprehended someone involved in gun violence, actually mostly what they're doing is following people around in parts, you know. But yeah, I guess like uh, traffic tickets and don't make the news very, very often. <laughs> um, uh, we have a, a question from uh, for Jaime for, uh, from Andrea. Uh, so uh, how does the local white population respond to these dynamics? And uh, like thinking about the case of Brazil specifically, uh, has Bolsonaro actually made things worse at the local level too? Uh, it seems that Bolsonaro is supported by white middle classes that feel threatened by street crime and openly advocate for police brutality. So I guess it's a question about the white population and for Brazil case like Bolsonaro's kind of um, um, role in, in the current dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the white population uh, felt threatened, right? And yes, although there is no evidence of this increasing crime in Brazil, as all of us, I guess all of us who know that crime in Brazil has been ha high for quite a while, consistently high in, in, in Brazil, mainly talking about homicide, but police kills at least 25% the 20, 25% of these homicides are by the police. So in Brazil, in the case of Brazil, there is no, there is no like more reduction in, in, in homicide because police kills too much, quotation marks there, right? So yeah, what I mean is that like gangs, for example, in places like Sao Paulo, for example, there is a deal, a pact among gangs that they have reduced the, homicide of violence in Sao Paulo, for example, but the police kill so much that it doesn't go down as much as we'd like to. Just to see the irony of Brazil. That is to say that uh, we have a police state in Brazil, right? So Bolsonaro is actually not a former captain, as we know, 
and of course he's giving voices to these imaginaries of policy and how the police is victim uh, the victimization of the police is something that it comes no very well fits very well in this rhetoric right because the police officers are just heroes national heroes that have to clean the country from this violence but we know that all these mark words that he uses against the corruption against the workers party again uh, to protect the family to protect the uh, green and the yellow color of the, our nation all these are coded words for anti-blackness uh, all these are coded words for this hate you know this odium of the black people the order that brazil is missing it is characteristic as a pure nation right so in this sense the policing and i think the question is very important because that was i was i was also asking about to ask megan if we can you know maybe thinking here about the work that policing does no, like I think I always think about this. Well, let's see here. More, more than just 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 ticketing people, policing lives, uh, producing dead bodies. The police must be producing something else here. I mean, I mean, I mean, he you not know, no. Mega trying to think in terms of uh, Stuart House groundbreaking world, right? Mugging the crisis. You no, know, when he was talking about right, how new liberalism was really you no. Know? about this i mean policing was really about enforcing the, this new liberal order right so maybe perhaps we can think also about what's the productivity of policy violence here right what kind of things policy produces here? then to uh, to, uh, to answer andrea we're speculating here, i think the policing in the case of colombia in the case of brazil policing produce ontological certainties for a nations that may be losing its certainties because well in this place that we don't know who is whom because all of us are mixed, we are racially ambiguous, and now we have affirmative actions, and now we have all these new movements, new identity movements. We must have ways to enforce the certainties of who, you, who we are. So it is, uh, this, uh, these certainties are especially you know, anchored as well. For example, the marker, the marking the boundaries of the city, the, the marking the boundaries of legality, whose bodies are legal, whose bodies are illegal, and the marking the boundaries of citizenship, who belongs, who not belongs to the city, right? So in that sense, I see my work, you know, uh, trying to dialogue here with this literature that see policing as the management of social death is a way that policing here is a very productive from the point of view of democracy from the point of view of policy making from the point of view of my academia from the point of view of liberal humanism policy is fine policing produces certainty police gives the white subject of rights a certainty that he or she is a subject, that his or her loyalty to the state is not to be challenged, that the contractual relation between the white citizen and the state can be enforced and the white uh, citizen can say to the police, hey, how dare you to beat me up? I pay tax, I am a citizen, I also wear under the constitution, I also vote. So that is, I think, is what policing does, right? Policing produces the certainty that desperately we need in this crazy world. Yeah, I, I guess like it produces the state in a way, right? Like uh... it can produce the state. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think that is a very yeah, yeah. yes. I, I guess like uh, perhaps the case of Australia, it, it's, it's it's kind of like it has similarities in the sense of kind of also you have this kind of racialized uh, idea of the nation, right? And do you see policing in, 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 in your case also as kind of like this production of this boundaries of citizenship and, and nation as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I would say is that um, it, one of the things that the Australian state won't do is acknowledge uh, ongoing, you know, settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. It's ongoing, right? Um, and so we, the way that police talk about and conduct policing of Indigenous peoples is uh, sometimes on the ground might relate to similar practices or strategies. 
but ultimately it produces social death and often physical death for Indigenous peoples, but it has to be invisibilised. And so the police don't, uh, they don't do the grandstanding that I spoke about, you know, they don't do this thing of we're policing Middle Eastern criminals and that's really, they can't because to do that would actually bring into being or acknowledge Indigenous claims to the land uh, and that, that mm -hmm. can't do that, it risks the entire fabric of the state, but they have to valorise attempts at policing and, you know, get the, um, recreate the state in other ways. And this is why the policing of um, Middle Eastern people will never be equivalent to the policing of Indigenous peoples. And I certainly don't want to suggest that that's the case because that completely misconstrues Australian history. But just as the police, uh, their primary targets are Indigenous peoples, uh, those peoples and the, stra the strategies involved have to be invisibilised um, to preserve settler claims to sovereignty and so actually policing racializes different groups to different ends and uh, racial order and racial um, categorization uh, then it happens in different ways but very much the state is reliant on those categories and those people being racialized to different ends. Yeah, I guess like in the case of Brazil, uh, um, just coming back a bit, like for instance, like we have the constantly the, the state denying the existence of racism in a way, uh, in a similar way of you were saying, because if you recognize the existence of racialized, of racism, you have to recognize the kind of like claims from the black community against pol police brutality in the future, right? Uh, so I, I'm I'm being bad with the with the the, the chat here. I'm just saying we had uh, from Stanlip, uh, wonderful presentation. Thanks, Jamie and Megan. From Winnie, thank you so much. I get seen response to uh, the the response that you gave to, gave to your gave to her question. Really interesting. Andrea, in response to uh, your response, Jamie, saying thanks, good points, and Scott about the same brief response, Jaime. Uh, and from Fides, policy is the management of social death. Great point. Definitely would love to quote you on this for my policy module. <laughs> I think you probably can, Fides. <laughs> but you have to check the, po the, the citing guidelines to see how you would do that. <laughs> uh, I guess like, um, we have a couple of minutes more. Uh, if anyone else has any other questions, or if uh, either Jaime or Megan, if you would like to, you know, elaborate more on any of the points that came up in the discussion. I I I really like Mega your comments on this shared criminalization, right? That the Middle Eastern have uh, uh, this experience of shared criminalization, because there is where I also find a point of uh, uh, dialogue here with this ethnographic context that I try to show here, because you know uh, what struck me so much in this community is how uh, police creates these or policing reinforces this emotional bound, this emotional bounds between gang members and the community. In the imaginary of the city, there is the gang members one, the community another one. No, but this shared, this shared vulnerability to police violence renders this division, you no, know, very unreal. Uh, because when the police comes mm -hmm. and invades the community, the police doesn't care if one is a church goer or one is a gang member. If one is a hard worker, or one is unemployed. So uh, this in itself it carries with this potentiality, right? Uh, what I'm mean thinking here is how can we, right, as a scholar, in, term, in terms of vindicating, vindicating these bodies, the terrorists, the suspect, the drug dealer, the all these undesired people as part of our community. It is not up to debate 
uh, the criminal status or the past. It's not up to debate. What we are discussing here is a share of vulnerability that turn the university professor uh, or, 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 or the gang member the same. University professor in South Sydney or, or, or a gang member in, in, in the outskirts of Cali maybe share the same vulnerability to police terror and this shared vulnerability may question not the gang member but question me and you and all of us in this class about our loyalty to the state and our loyalty to this fantasy that we may be different and this may be the place for possibilities of resistance embracing the dead embrace the evil mm. Yeah, I guess like I, I was thinking when when you in the end of your presentation when you're talking about like the right to the city and insurrection and kind of like uh, what you said uh, later on about how Holocene is this kind of face of neoliberalism and how it manifests in the city and how perhaps like this insurrection against Holocene practices is a kind of like a, a claim to the to the right to the city, not in the kind of like a classic Marxist class related sense but more mediated by, by by race right as you say it can mobilize this kind of um quite different in, sort of like a uh interclass kind of cross-class uh subjects which are in a way targeted by by the police and and insurrect together in a way and we're seeing that perhaps in the us of all places, right, with the the the, the um, Black Lives Matter movement uh, quite prominently. So, um, I guess uh, we have a bit from Jonathan. He says, "No question, but just to say thanks for two really informative and thought-provoking presentations." Uh, from Fides again, thank you so much for the presentations. Very informative and definitely enlightened me more on the current situations in both Australia and Colombia. Thank you again. Um, and I guess if there are no more questions, I will just like, like to thank you both so much for your very insightful and thought provoking talks and, and also for this discussion um, um, and for like um, being so generous with your, your sharing of your work with us today uh and um for those who couldn't listen to my introduction in the beginning because my internet apparently was very poor uh we this seminar is part of the urban intersections webinar series and if you would like to see this recording or the recording of our uh previous events or get to know a bit more about uh the collective you can go on our website and and and, and hopefully come back for any future events. And uh, thank you so much, Megan. Thank you so much, Jaime. This has been really, truly great as I thought it would be. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Pleasure to meet you all too. Pleasure. My pleasure. Bye bye.